What's up guys, it's Doll Matter here, and today we're going to be reacting to a new channel. So this one I've never seen before, it is Extra History, and the video is part of the first part of a series on Khosrau Anushirwan. Uh, um, I know it's Khosrau, I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce his last name. He was the leader of Sasanian Persia in, I believe, the 500s. Um, kind of reinvigorated the war against the Byzantines, or the Eastern Roman Empire. And, uh, yeah, not, not much else to say about him other than that, that I, that I know of at least Middle Eastern history, not really my forte. Um, I really do want to learn more about the Middle East and uh, Southeast Asia and India. Those are probably, you know, if you're talking about like this time period, there's probably the three areas I know the least about. Um, usually anything I know about it is in relation to basically them fighting the Byzantines or the Romans or whoever, right? So that's how I know who this guy is, is because he obviously uh, went to war with Byzantium, you know, Rome, whatever you want to call it. Um, so, yeah, anyway, uh, link to the original video down below. And again, this is Khosrau Anushirwan, Like Father, Like Son, Extra History Part 1. Let's jump into it. Story of Khosrau Anushirwan, ruler of a golden age. We first have to understand his father... Is this the guy that used to do those spirit science videos? I don't know if those are still on YouTube. I'll see if I can find one. But the voice sounds like the guy that used to do the spirit science videos. Um, oh, it still is on YouTube. So a week ago, I made a short called, Can You Define God? Yeah, so these, uh, man, I... These are used to, these are so funny. I don't know if these are still a thing. Um, apparently he's still putting out videos. Where's the old one? This guy was like a crazy cult leader or something. Um, where's the, there was an old one. <clears throat> Play the open beta. It's an Xbox ad. Um, but yeah, these spear signs, they literally, I don't know if it's the same voice changer or if it's the same guy, but the voice sounds like identical to the spirit science guy. Um, yeah, it's, let me see here. I don't know if he's. On my cosmic travels through life, reality, and the universe, I have come across many things. One... Kavad. Kavad ruled... One of the most amazing of these revelations, however, is knowledge about... I'm pretty sure it's the same fucking guy. Dude, if, if this is the same dude, then this guy's like a crazy... Like, he... I'm not... Uh, he had, like, this weirdo religion, and then he had, like, a crazy conspiracy... Th like, he had, like, all these crazy conspiracy theories, and... Yeah, anyway. Hopefully his history videos are better than his spirit science videos, because those are some nut bar videos. The great empire of Iran. The West called it Persia, and he saw that empire brought to the brink of collapse. And boy, oh boy, did he not enjoy that experience. Prince Kavad spent his childhood like most young boys do, held hostage by his father's greatest enemy. His captors were the Hephthalites, a Central Asian tribe that had pushed their way up to the borders of Iran. They were new, they were powerful, and they had made the Iranians very, very nervous. Their relationship... <laughs> uh, I, th I thought that was an IV for a second. I'm like, what IVs he hooked up to? Then I realized it was a battery, full power battery. Had started so well, though. They had helped Kavad's father win his throne. They had fought at his side in a couple of wars. But then they got into an argument over who controlled a town on their shared border. Naturally, Kavad's father had gone to war over it, and he had lost. He had lost so badly that the Heftalites actually took him captive, and he'd had to pay his own ransom just so he could go back to ruling Iran again. He was a little testy about that, and so of course he went- Yeah, tale as old as time, right? Um, getting the step tribes to help you out, and then s something happens, you don't pay them, there's a dis disagreement on something. Um, they just decide, hey, this guy's weak, let's take him over. Um, the Step Tribes were never the most loyal people. Um, that's why so many people speak Step Tribe languages now, right? All the Turkic languages, all the Indo-European languages. Um, yeah. Uh, never trust somebody from the Step Tribes. <laughs> I guess there's no Step Tribes left anymore, but... Went to war with them a second time, and he lost again. 
This time, he was forced to give them Kavad as a hostage, because surely he wouldn't attack them again if they held his son. He did, though. I mean, third time's the charm, right? And he didn't get captured this time. He got killed, along with the rest of the Iranian army. The Hephthalites pushed forward, and the Iranians were in a panic. Kavad's uncle had been put on the throne, but man, he did not know what to do. Enter Sukra, a minister to the former Shah and leader of a powerful noble family. He took command of the army and managed to stop the Hephthalite advance. Sukra then negotiated the terms of a new truce, agreeing to pay a heavy tribute in exchange for peace and the return of all Iranian property, including the dead Shah's son, Kavad. Sukra returned home a hero. People celebrated him in the streets. But Kavad wasn't so lucky. Though he was the previous Shah's son, the noble families of Iran decided to elect Kavad's uncle as the new Shah. After all, how could they trust this boy who had just spent years as a prisoner of the enemy? One noble even wanted to see Kavad executed, but Sukra, who had just gone to all this trouble rescuing the kid, managed to convince the nobles to merely imprison Kavad instead. So the poor kid got sent away yet again. <laughs> this time to... Man, I'm not, oh my god, imagine you get captured by the step tribes, you're their prisoner for years, your dad gets killed, the army gets wiped out, some noble from your country comes and saves you, and then they just throw you in prison again. <laughs> the fort Be, honestly, being like a, a royal or noble child back in the day would suck ass. Fortress of Oblivion. I am not kidding, that was the prison's actual name. Don't say history never gave you anything. Honestly, Kavad had been better off with the Hephthalites. Sure, he had been their prisoner, but they always treated him like more of a guest. And frankly, prisons don't earn names like Fortress of Oblivion for being comfortable. Somehow, though, Kavad managed to escape, and when he did, he ran right back to the Hephthalites. He promised them gold, and in return, they promised to help him win back his rightful throne. Thus, in 488 CE, Kavad marched to the capital at Tesiphon with a sizable foreign army at his heels. This time, the nobles sided with him, as did Sukra. They deposed his uncle without a fight, and Kavad was confirmed as the new Shah. Sukra became his advisor and tutor, since the new Shah was still pretty young and had definitely not spent much time in Iran recently. At first, Kavad welcomed Sukra's advice, but he eventually came to realize that his so-called advisor wanted him as a puppet, not a Shah. When people had problems in need of solving, they always Quadratic brought those problems formula. to Sukra. And when Kavad tried to weigh in with his own suggestions, everybody ignored him. He soon realized that the crown he wore and the throne he sat on were mere decoration. Sukra truly ruled this empire. Now, it is true that a handful of noble families had always been the real power behind the throne of Iran. It had... Uh, and that's, to be fair, that's kind of true of, like, every empire or kingdom ever, right? Um, there's always a figurehead, right? Whether it be the king, the queen, the emperor, empress, um, the chief, or whatever. But they derive their power, in most, most scenarios, they derive their power from... Um, you know, people within the kingdom, right? Whether that be, you know, the military or the nobles or sometimes even the peasants, right? They have to have somebody supporting them. That way they have power because really power, like when it comes to political power, is just the, you know, the state has a monopoly on violence in most societies, right? And being able to use that violence to coerce people into getting what you want is all that the, you know, it's all government power really is. Um, right? Like, even something as small as, like, a parking ticket, right? If you don't pay that parking ticket, then you get fines, and then if you don't pay those fines, then eventually you'll have a, a debt collector or somebody come after you, and then eventually, you know, uh, they might send the police after you to try and get you to appear in court, and then, you know, if you keep resisting, eventually there's a gun, right? That's the thing. Even something as small as a parking ticket eventually leads to you getting a gun, and if you keep trying to resist, then you're eventually gonna get shot, right? So, all political power is is just the ability to monopolize force. And you have to monopolize that through, you know, nobles, military. There's different ways to do it in different societies, but that's, you know, it's the same thing. Had been that way for centuries, but they were supposed to stay behind the throne. They each oversaw specific regions on the Shah's behalf, much like feudal lords. And while the locals might serve their noble families, those families were supposed to serve the Shah. 
it had worked this way for so long that the biggest noble families, like Sucras, had been in power even longer than the Sasanian dynasty Kavad descended from. And yeah, the nobles had always meddled in royal affairs. Kavad's uncle was not the first Shah they had deposed, and he would not be the last, but the way Sucra was now holding court and giving orders on the Shah's behalf? That was not done. After five years of struggling to assert control over his own advisor, Kavad ordered Sukra to leave the capital and go back to his home city. Sukra obeyed, but only because it put him out of the Shah's reach. From such a safe distance, he could brag openly about how Kavad wouldn't even have a throne if not for him. And even living away from the capital, he held all the power. The Empire's taxes were still brought to him. He still commanded the army. Kavad had nothing. The stars had aligned for Sukra. To all appearances, he stood on the brink of claiming the throne for himself. This is what Kavad had counted on. If he knew one thing about Iran's noble families, it was this. Through all the centuries of intrigue, manipulation, and outright bloodshed, the one thing that always served to keep noble families in check was their rivalry with other noble families. Mm -hmm. Now, with Sukra visibly rising to new heights of power, and openly bragging about it no less, his most bitter rivals took action. Egged on by Kavad, they gathered and raised their own army to march on Sukra's home. Soon, they deposited both Sukra and his vast treasury at Kavad's feet. The young Shah had eliminated the greatest threat to his reign while barely lifting a finger. Sukra was executed and removed from the board, but Kavad was just getting started. Never again would he allow a noble family to rise against him the way Sukra just had. The nobles must be cut off at the knees. See, a new movement had been brewing in Iran ever since the death of Kavad's the new father. Movement brew. The threat of a Hephthalite invasion had sent a ripple of fear through the empire. And in that atmosphere, people had turned to new faiths with new answers. One priest in particular named Mazdak had split from the official tenets of Iran's Zoroastrian religion and begun preaching a new doctrine. Mazdak believed in peace, free love, and eating veggies. He was basically a 5th century hippie and he argued for the complete redistribution of wealth and the peaceful elimination of entrenched upper-class nobility like Sukra. So, yeah, this is kind of hilarious, because um, this is something you see in a lot of societies, right? Um, like, people act like socialism is a new idea, right? Socialism, communism, whatever you want to call it. These ideas are old as hell, right? You see this in ancient Greece, you see this in ancient Rome, you see this right here in... in uh, you know, the Sasanian Empire. Um, you see this in ancient India, ancient Egypt. Um, you know, these ideas always, always, always come to fruition. Uh, like, you know, it's it's kind of like the part of the natural rise and decay of a civilization is going through a socialist period, um, right? We recently saw Russia decay with their socialist period, um, still kind of decaying, honestly. And I'm sure, you know, Soon it'll probably be the West, right? We see the rise of socialism in the West recently. And then we'll probably decay. And yeah, it's just part of the natural life cycle of societies. Last idea very much. So the Shah gave up meat, embraced free love, and became a Mazdakite. With Kavad's blessing, Mazdak threw open the imperial granaries and began distributing food to the people. They also divided up land that had been held by the noble families for centuries, weakening noble control of the realm. For the first time in Kavad's reign, the people loved him. They sang his praises the way they used to sing Sukras for saving them from the Hephthalites. But both the nobility and the high-ranking priesthood, those powers which had stood behind the throne for centuries, hated him. Kavad had made a mistake. Maybe he thought he could restrain Mazdak's more ambitious ideas about equality. Or maybe he thought that this popularity with the people would keep him safe. But he had reached too far too fast. The nobles rose up against him, deposed him, and once again threw him into the Fortress of Oblivion. Boy, I love that name. They then put his younger brother on the throne to undo Mazdek's reforms and be their new puppet Shah. Alas, though the Fortress of Oblivion continued to have a very, very cool name, it also continued to be very, very bad at containing Kavad's. Kavad escaped once again <laughs> and fled to his old friends, the Hephthalites. I think it might be time to face the hard truth that the Fortress of Oblivion was just not a very good prison. Yes, I am disappointed too.
The Heftalites were just True, as happy a name to like accept that. Kavad's money as last time, funny. though. So once again, he boldly marched up to Tessiphon. His poor brother, who had never really been that into this whole Shah idea anyway, quickly stepped aside, and for the second time, Kavad became the Shah of Iran. But it's fair to say at this point that Kavad's reign had thus far been... Mm, troubled. One disaster after another, really. And all of these upheavals had left the empire weak. The army was still under the fractured control of the noble families, and Iran's wealth was being sapped away year after year in costly tributes to appease the Hephthalites. And to top it off, Mazdek and his followers continued to push their aggressive social reforms forward, even after Kavad had tried to tone down his support of their ideals. Things did not look good for the K-Man, but he was undeterred. Kavad believed he could bring his empire back from the brink of ruin, but it would take a lifetime, perhaps even two lifetimes. Luckily, he might just have two lifetimes to work with. Just before he had been deposed, a new wife had given birth to his third son. The boy was young, but Kavad saw potential in him. This child could be molded to carry on the legacy that Kavad now hoped to build. That boy's name was Khosro. Hmm. So I, I wonder what, what happened to his other sons that he didn't want them to rule. Maybe he just didn't... <sighs> Maybe he just didn't start grooming them young enough to be in that role. Um, but yeah. It is kind of funny that the prison, you know, the prison of oblivion is like the, the easiest prison ever to break out of. It breaks out of it when he's like 13, 14, and then breaks out of it again as a full-grown adult. Um, but yeah, the... Uh, that, that was really interesting. I didn't know a lot of that stuff, right? Like, uh, obviously, you know, you kind of see some patterns that are normal throughout all of human history and all of society, um, both for that time period and just in general throughout history. Um, you know, like, the kind of, like, semi-feudalistic society, uh, this, like, push for a kind of, like, more socialist, egalitarian-type worldview. Um, so much of this stuff just, you know, it, it constantly resurfaces throughout society, and it's really fascinating. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm interested to get into part two, and uh, this is definitely a, a good informative video. I, I'm not, I'm still not sure if this is the same guy as Spirit Science, because he seemed a little too normal and not insane to be the Spirit Science guy, but maybe he has just toned down for this channel. But uh, if it's the same guy as Spirit Science, let me know down below, because I'm still confused about that. But anyway, uh, let me know what you think down below, like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.